a moderately prosperous society in all respects. The decisive stage in achieving the first centenary goal, October 29th, 2015, part of the speech at the second full assembly of the fifth plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee. To realize a moderately prosperous society in all respects by the year 2020 is a solemn promise that our party has made to the Chinese people and to posterity. The end of the 13th five-year plan period 2016 to 2020 coincides with the deadline we have set for the attainment of this goal, which means that this will be the last five-year plan in the drive to realize the goal. The tasks of the party and government over the coming five years, therefore, boil down to one thing, to achieve the final victory in the decisive push to realize the first of our two centenary goals. In the early stage of reform and opening up, Deng Xiaoping first used the term moderate prosperity to describe Chinese-style modernization, introducing the goal of establishing a society in which people lead a fairly comfortable life by the end of the 20th century. Footnote 1. Deng Xiaoping, We Should Take a Longer-Range View in Developing Sino-Japanese Relations, Selected Works of Deng Xiaoping, Volume 3, English Edition, Foreign Languages Press, Beijing, 1994, page 63-64, to 64. end of footnote 1. Thanks to the concerted efforts of the whole party and all the people, this goal was attained on schedule at the end of the last century. The Chinese people had on the whole attained a moderately prosperous standard of living. On this foundation, the 16th CPC National Congress in 2002 introduced the goal of comprehensively building and realizing a moderately prosperous society of a higher level for the benefit of more than 1 billion people in the first 20 years of this century. Since then, committed to the goal, our party has one step after another made remarkable progress in pursuit of the goal. Now, with the finishing line in sight, it is time to make a final dash in this journey of two decades. Completing this strategic task is both our historic responsibility and our greatest honor. We must be soberly aware that while we have what it takes to attain the goal on schedule, the task we face is still enormous and the road ahead will not be easy going. As various problems overlap and risks mount, we are still facing grave and complex challenges. If we fail to respond to these challenges properly or if we encounter systemic risks or commit serious errors, then the process will be delayed and could even stall. Therefore, all party members must be fully prepared for what lies ahead, not just mentally, but also in what we do. We must have a clear picture of the situation, strengthen our confidence, and continue to work with determination. An ancient scholar said, you are bound to fail if you only know what to do without knowing the situation. Footnote 2. Lu Zhi, Border Defense. Lun Yuan Bian Shou, Bei Shi Yi Zhuang. Lu Zhi, 754-805, was an official and thinker of the Tang Dynasty. End of footnote 2. Despite the profound and complex changes in both international and domestic environments, our assessment that China is in the midst of an important period of strategic opportunity for development still stands. Internationally speaking, the current political and economic situation is on the whole conducive to preserving the overall trend of world peace and development. 
the world economy is making a difficult recovery amidst deep adjustments, the global governance system is undergoing profound changes, and the world balance of power is becoming increasingly equitable. These factors have created a relatively stable external environment for China's development. Domestically speaking, our considerable material foundations, abundant human resources, vast markets, and enormous potential for development all determine that our economic fundamentals remain favorable for long-term growth. Though we have entered a new normal of economic development and experienced an unavoidable shift in economic growth, it should be noted that the transformation of our growth model is gaining momentum, the structure of the economy is constantly improving, new growth drivers are replacing old ones, and reform and opening up is unleashing new impetus for development. All this suggests that the sound trend of economic development we are currently seeing can be sustained. Building on the targets and requirements set forth of the 16th CPC National Congress and taking into consideration new conditions and developments, the recommendations of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China for the 13th Five-Year Plan for Economic and Social Development have set forth new goals for building a moderately prosperous society in all respects over the coming five years. These targets and requirements together with those introduced at the 16th, 17th, and 18th National Congresses of the CPC in 2002, 2007, and 2012 constitute a pledge we have made to the people. We must do everything possible in our power to see that they are realized. As these targets and requirements have already been covered in the recommendations. What I would like to talk about here is how to keep command of and advance these initiatives. The targets and requirements laid out in the recommendations are directed towards the entire country, but that does not mean they can be applied uniformly to all localities. For example, to achieve the goals of doubling China's 2010 GDP and per capita income by 2020, we will need to sustain an average economic growth rate of 6.5% and raise the per capita disposable incomes of urban and rural residents by at least 5.8% per year for the fit for the 13th five-year plan period, which in effect means synchronizing the growth of the economy and of incomes. Footnote 3. These goals were set in the political report, firmly march on the path of socialism with Chinese characteristics, and strive to complete the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects to the 18th CPC National Congress in 2012. End of footnote 3. It is clearly not possible for all parts of the country to sustain such rates of growth. A more realistic scenario is that some areas will see higher growth rates while others will see lower growth rates. For certain central and western regions, old revolutionary base areas, ethnic minority areas, border areas, and impoverished areas, and particularly agricultural production zones and key ecosystem service zones, our primary goals will be to guarantee national food security and ecological security and achieve notable progress in various social programs, seeking in particular to raise standards of living and improve public services by a significant margin. We must guarantee the basic needs of food and clothing for those living in poverty and ensure that they have proper access to compulsory education, medical care, and safe housing whilst working to raise their incomes above the poverty line. This does not mean that per capita GDP and per capita income in all localities throughout the country 
must reach the national average before moderate prosperity across the, the board can be achieved. What I must make clear is that to bring about a moderately prosperous society in all respects is not to start another massive campaign to make rapid progress. We cannot realize the goal of doubling GDP and per capita income by relying on an extensive mode of development or by turning to strong stimulus measures to boost the pace of growth. That would only take us back down the same old road and create new stresses and problems. As we are working to build a moderately prosperous society in all respects, we also need to consider more long-term development requirements and accelerate our efforts to create a mode of economic development that is suited to the new normal. Only in this way will we be able to realize a moderately prosperous society of high quality and lay down a stronger foundation for realizing the second of the two centenary goals. How to resolve major difficulties in realizing the first centenary goal. October 29th, 2015. Part of the speech at the second full assembly of the 5th Plenary Session of the 18th CPC Central Committee. To achieve the targets and tasks set at the ongoing Plenary Session, we must redouble our efforts to resolve major difficulties. It is a mission we must accomplish as well as a barrier we must overcome. As an ancient Chinese thinker put it, leaders chart the course while the people get the job done. Footnote 1, Chun Liang on tackling major issues in governance, Lun Zhe Yao Zhe Dao. Chun Liang, 1143 to 1194, was a thinker and writer of the Southern Song Dynasty. End of footnote 1. Firstly, in transforming the economic growth model, we must focus on improving the quality and efficiency of development. Economic development is the foundation. Without it, nothing is possible. Since the introduction of reform and opening up in 1978, we have been focusing on development with outstanding success. To complete the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects, we still need to make development our top priority and bring it to a new level. We should stick to the strategy that development alone can make the difference, ensuring that an effective approach is taken to development, intensifying structural reform, and focusing on improving the quality and efficiency of development in order to achieve higher quality, fairer, more efficient, and more sustainable development. Currently, China's economy faces significant downward pressure. This is partly due to the influence of global and periodical factors, but fundamentally it is due to structural problems. For instance, an important reason for the current economic downturn is the slowing down of industrial growth as the industrial structure is forced to adapt to changing needs and some industries are afflicted by excessive industrial capacity. These are also the main causes of poor corporate performance. The key to improving the quality and efficiency of development lies in moving faster to change the economic growth model and adjust the economic structure and in taking resolute measures to reduce overcapacity. There is no other correct choice. The 13th five-year plan period, 2016 to 2020, provides an important window of opportunity for transforming the economic growth model and adjusting the economic structure. If we fail to achieve this and instead implement stimulus policy for short-term economic growth, we will continue to jeopardize future growth. If we hesitate to address the conflicts and problems arising from our traditional economic growth model and simply mark time, we will lose this precious window of opportunity and deplete the valuable resources we have accumulated since the introduction of reform and opening up. This has been proved by the experience of many countries, 
Opportunities never wait for us, and neither do problems. Economic development should maintain a certain pace, on condition that high quality and efficiency are guaranteed. The mounting downward pressure on the economy appears on the surface to be the result of insufficient effective demand, but is actually caused by inefficient effective supply. In general, the industrial capacity of our country is huge, but it is partly compromised by ineffective supply and lacks effective supply of high quality and high level. China is a big producer and exporter, but most of our products and technology are low-end, while few are high-tech, high-quality, and high-added value. We must focus on improving the quality and level of supply, as well as expanding demand. In the past, our industrial capacity was limited, and emphasis was therefore on advancing it by expanding investment. Now, our capacity is excessive. If we still rely on expanding large-scale investment to speed up growth, the effect will be limited and the marginal utility will diminish. Although in the short term investment can be an important fuel for economic growth, final consumption is the lasting engine. In this regard, while expanding effective investment and ensuring it plays a key role, we must give full play to the fundamental role that consumption plays in fueling growth. We must implement in a vigorous and orderly manner the three strategic initiatives, the Belt and Road Initiative, the coordinated development of Beijing, Tianjin, and Haibei, and the Yangtze River Economic Belt. These initiatives represent new space for development, and we must expand these in the near future. Over the past 30 years, three city clusters have gradually emerged, the Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei region, the Yangtze River Delta, and the Pearl River Delta, and have become the main regions driving national development. Northeast China, the Central Plains, the middle reaches of the Yangtze River, and the Chengdu-Chongqing region, each with a population of more than 100 million, are big markets with ample conditions to form complete industrial systems and create new space for development. Of course, we must produce an optimal strategy for regional planning, press ahead with this, and avoid any short-sighted measures. In regard to the key tasks of transforming the economic growth model and adjusting the economic structure, specific requirements have been put forward in the recommendations of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China for the 13th Five-Year Plan for Economic and Social Development. The key to realizing these requirements lies in securing high quality and efficient development. First, investments must be productive. Expanding investment can boost growth. However, if too many investments are inefficient and produce no returns, the relevant loans and debts cannot be repaid and will become bad loans, creating financial risks for enterprises and fiscal and financial risks for the state. Although the payback period of infrastructure investment and particularly of public service infrastructure investment is long, we should not do things decades in advance. And even with reference to those projects that we should activate, we should consider whether our financial resources are sufficient. Second, products must be marketable which determines whether an investment will have reasonable returns. If the government, without analyzing the market, replaces enterprises in allocating resources or encourages enterprises to expand investment through preferential policies, it will probably hinder continued progress. Third, enterprises must make profits. Being an enterprise means having the ability to make money. Should an enterprise fail to make profits or make unsustainable losses 
for a period of two or three years, it affects not only the growth rate, but also its employees' income and the government's revenues, which will result in financial and even social risks. We must base our policies on the development of enterprises and particularly of the enterprises in the real economy, pay close attention to their sound development and enhance their profitability. Fourth, employees must have reasonable incomes. People go to, to work to earn a living. No one would work in a company if wages do not meet the needs of the employees or are lower than the average salary determined by the market. Of course, if wages rise faster than a company's profits determined by the macro economy, the higher wages will become a heavy burden. In such circumstances, some labor-intensive overseas-funded enterprises will transfer to other countries with lower wage costs. Fifth, the government must collect taxes. The government must provide public services and infrastructure. Where does the government get the money? Mainly from tax revenues. The government can also issue bonds, but cannot overindulge. If the government has no tax revenues to do those things it should do when the economy grows fast, the standard of living and public services cannot be improved, and it will be hard to maintain social harmony and stability. The government's money must be spent wisely. Government spending must be carefully controlled. Transforming our economic growth model and adjusting the economic structure are the key tasks of the 13th five-year plan period. With a focus on making profound adjustment of the economic structure and on rejuvenating the real economy, we must adjust and improve related policies, establish a new industrial system, foster a core of strategic industries, build an industrial system for modern agriculture, and make China into a strong manufacturer and an effective provider of modern services. Innovation is the principal engine driving the shift in the economic growth model and the adjustment of the economic structure. We must encourage new technology, new industries, and new forms of business, aiming to be at the forefront of international scientific and technological research, we must produce numerous significant innovations, promote the industrial application of scientific and technological advances, and ensure that innovations are commercialized in real economic activity in order to form new products and industries. Secondly, in strengthening areas of weakness, we must properly address imbalanced development. To realize a moderately prosperous society in all respects, we must not only have in our mind a moderately prosperous society, we must also focus on the issue of in all respects, the latter being more important and more difficult to achieve. A moderately prosperous society represents a certain level of development, while in all respects extends that level of development to one that is balanced, coordinated, and sustainable. If unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable development becomes a more serious problem and our areas of weakness become more prominent, we cannot truly say we have realized our goals even if we accomplish the goals for GDP and growth rate by 2020 as scheduled. In that case, even if we declare we have attained the goals, they will not be recognized by our people and the international community. To realize a moderately prosperous society in all respects, we must seek economic, political, cultural, social, and ecological progress. We should ensure a better developed economy, more complete democracy, more advanced science and education, a more thriving culture, a more harmonious society, and a higher standard of living. While making economic development our central task, we must strive for economic, political, cultural, social, and ecological progress and coordinate all aspects of our drive for modernization. All these must progress together. We cannot have a situation where some advance at the expense of others. 
For example, the pace of ecological progress is rather slow. Through over 30 years of rapid, continuous economic development, our capacity for producing agricultural products and manufactured items and for providing services has enhanced rapidly, but our capacity for preserving ecosystems has shrunk and the environment in some places is still deteriorating. We must try our best to enhance ecological progress, incorporate ecological ideas, principles, and goals into all our economic and social development efforts, include them in our plans at all levels, and implement them. Functional zoning is the fundamental system for protecting and using our land-air resources and the principal measure to protect the environment at the source. Although it was first proposed several years ago, it has not been carried out to the letter. In our land of 9.6 million square kilometers, natural conditions vary enormously in different places. If we err in functional zoning, it will not be easy to put things right in the future. We must move faster to enhance policies concerning functional zoning and differentiated performance appraisal and drive all regions to develop in line with their functional definitions. We must give high priority to protecting the environment and letting nature restore itself and protect and restore the ecosystems of mountains, waters, forests, and farmland. We must intensify our efforts in, in environment governance, reform the fundamental system of environment governance, make all natural ecosystems more stable and better able to provide services, and safeguard national ecological security. To realize a moderately prosperous society in all respects, we must ensure that all the people are covered and share the fruits of development. The main problems that arise in completing a moderately prosperous society in all respects lie in the area of living standards. A lack of all-round development to a great extent manifests itself in the well-being of different social groups. In a country, the people are the most important. Footnote 2 Fang Xuan Ling et al. Book of Jin, Jin Shu Fang Juan, Xuan Ling, 579-648, was an official of the Tang Dynasty. End of footnote 2. To ensure that living standards are improved through the involvement and dedication of all people and the shared enjoyment of benefits therein, we must make sure basic living needs are met, focus on key areas, improve systems, and guide expectations. At the same time, we must emphasize equal opportunity and guarantee basic living standards. Poverty alleviation of the impoverished rural population is our biggest area of weakness. Bringing about a moderately prosperous society in all respects does not mean that each and every individual is ensured the same level of prosperity, but if the living standards of the currently impoverished rural population of over 70 million do not improve noticeably, our realization of a moderately prosperous society in all respects will lack credibility. Therefore, in the recommendations, helping the impoverished rural population shake off poverty is regarded as a fundamental indicator of the realization of a moderately prosperous society in all respects. In the recommendations, emphasis is placed on the implementation of targeted poverty alleviation and we are required, through applying greater determination and adopting a well-designed approach, to take stronger and an innovative measures to carry out our poverty alleviation projects in a bid to ensure that the, all the rural populations living below the current poverty threshold and all impoverished counties are lifted out of poverty and to solve the problems of regional poverty. Now, there are about 18 million urban residents living on subsistence allowances. We must improve our welfare systems to ensure their basic living needs are met. 
for more than 130 million senior citizens at and above 65 years old, we must increase our supply of elderly care and make medical services more convenient. For more than 200 million migrant workers in cities, we must gradually give them equal access to the basic public services where they now reside. For tens of millions of annual college graduates working in megapolises and other permanent residents in these urban areas, we must ensure they have suitable living conditions. For over 9 million urban res residents registered as unemployed, we must ensure that they have a vocational skill to achieve stable employment and a stable income. In summary, we must remain committed to a people-centered notion of development. For specific groups of people facing specific difficulties, we must try every means to help them solve practical problems. In the 13th five-year plan period, our revenue cannot increase at the same high pace as previously. We must strike a proper balance between developing the economy and safeguarding people's well-being. We must continue to intensify our efforts to safeguard people's well-being on the basis of economic development, yet we must not make promises beyond our financial means, which we would find hard to keep. We must focus on improving our basic public services, and particularly on increasing support for basic public services in old revolutionary bases, areas with concentrations of ethnic minorities, border areas, and poverty-stricken areas, and on assisting specific groups of people with special difficulties. On this basis, we must do a good job in education, employment, income distribution, social security, medical services, and health care. At the same time, we must keep our spending within the limits of our income and actively adjust the structure of fiscal expenditure. Earlier, we made some promises based on the rapid growth of our fiscal revenue. Now it seems necessary to study them from a sustainability perspective. We must be determined to reduce expenditures where necessary. To build a moderately prosperous society in all respects, we must ensure that every aspect is covered. There should be moderate prosperity in both urban and rural areas. We must narrow the urban-rural development gap, which is a major impediment to realizing a moderately prosperous society in all respects. We should view this issue dialectically. Urban and rural areas have different functions, as do different regions. The main parts of Qinghai and Tibet as a key eco-functional zone, commonly referred to as the world's third pole, have enormous value in producing eco-friendly products and providing services for ecological conservation. If the region is exploited blindly, resulting in destruction of the ecology, then we cannot correct that no matter how much money we spend in the future. However, in the existing accounting system in which only GDP is used to measure the level of development, the development disparity between this region and developed regions is inevitably growing. When we say narrow the urban-rural development gap, we cannot view it as only narrowing the gaps in GDP and growth rate, but rather we should view it as narrowing the gaps in the levels of residents' income, access to infrastructure, equitable access to basic public services, and living standards. In addition, we must have a comprehensive understanding of the rural-urban income gap the living costs, and in particular the housing costs, are quite different in urban and rural areas, and thus income alone is not an accurate reflection of real problems. Thirdly, in guarding against risks, we must focus on strengthening our awareness of and capacity for risk prevention and control. The next five years might become a period in which risks in all areas of our development will accumulate continuously and even become increasingly felt. 
The major threats we may encounter include domestic, economic, political, ideological, and social risks, and those from nature, as well as global economic, political, and military risks. If major risks occur and we are not able to fight against them, our national security could face fatal problems and the process of finishing building a moderately prosperous society will probably be interrupted. Nip the problem in the bud when it is in the making. Prepare yourself for risks yet to emerge, said our ancestors. Footnote 3. Liu Shu et al. Old Book of Tang, Jiu Tang Shu. Liu Shu, 887-946, was a statesman and historian during the Five Dynasties. End of footnote 3. We must try our best to prevent any major risks and, when they occur, be able to ward them off. In the past, we tended to think that the conflicts and problems afflicting the people resulted from a low level of economic development and low income. If only we could develop the economy, and if the people lived a better life, social conflicts and problems would consequently decrease. Now it seems that problems always exist, whether the economy is undeveloped or developed, and that the problems arising when the economy is developed are no fewer than those ar arising when the economy is undeveloped. They can even become more complicated. In this new era, if we fail to coordinate interests well and handle problems properly, the situation could deteriorate to the extent that it hinders our development process. What calls for special attention is that risks often may not occur alone, but more likely intertwine with each other and form a risk complex. With regard to possible risks, local party committees and governments at all levels must improve their sense of responsibility and consciousness and enhance risk prevention and control within the scope of their functions and duties. They must not pass the buck either up or to future party committees and governments, nor must they be irresponsible in their, in their work and thereby create risks. We must redouble our efforts to explore and identify the sources of risks, improve our capacity in dynamic monitoring and real-time alarms, and advance risk prevention and control in an effective and meticulous manner. We must have a clear idea of potential risks and their causes, prepare different remedies for different risks, and adopt a holistic approach. We must take timely and strong measures, strive to diffuse risks at the source, and prevent small risks from evolving into big ones, individual ones, into complex ones, partial ones, into regional or systemic ones, economic ones, into social and political ones, and global ones, into domestic ones. Take Targeted Measures Against Poverty November 27th, 2015 Main Points of the Speech at the Central Conference on Poverty Alleviation and Development Eliminating Poverty Improving Living Standards and Achieving Common Prosperity are the basic requirements of socialism and an important mission of the CPC. Building a moderately prosperous society in all respects is our fundamental promise to the people. We have sounded a clarion call in the battle against poverty. To win this battle, we should have firm resolve and solid goals and work hard with a down-to-earth spirit to bring reasonable prosperity to all poverty-stricken areas and individuals by 2020. This Conference on Poverty Alleviation and Development is the first central conference since the 5th Plenary Session of the 18th CPC Central Committee. This shows the Central Committee's deep concern for poverty relief, 
At that plenary session, starting from our fundamental promise, we committed to raising out of poverty all those defined by current standards as rural poor, raising out of poverty all those county, counties designated as poverty stricken and eliminating overall regional poverty by 2020. The major tasks of this conference are to implement the decision of the fifth plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee, analyze the current situation, map out our work in the final period of achieving the goal of moderate prosperity, make both present and future plans to carry out the work required, and mobilize all forces of the party and the nation to win this battle against poverty. Since the founding of the PRC in 1949, the CPC has led the people in fighting poverty. Through 37 years of effort, since we adopted reform and opening up in 1978, we have followed a poverty relief path with Chinese characteristics and lifted more than 700 million rural people out of poverty, laying the foundation for moderate prosperity throughout the country. China has lifted more people out of poverty than any other country, and it was the first to realize the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. This achievement deserves to be recorded in the annals of human social development, and it proves the worth of the CPC's leadership and Chinese socialism. We should be aware that China's battle against poverty remains tough. By the end of 2014, China still had a rural population of over 70 million living in poverty. Our poverty relief goals for the 13th five-year plan period, 2016 to 2020, are as follows. By 2020, the rural poor will be guaranteed food, clothing, compulsory education, basic medical care, and safe housing. In poverty-stricken areas, the growth rate in rural per capita disposable income will surpass the national average growth rate, and major indicators of basic public services will approach the national average. China's battle against poverty has entered the toughest stage. To achieve our goals, we must carry on the fight with firmer resolve, clearer thinking, more targeted measures, unique intensity, and concerted action, leaving behind no single poverty-stricken area or individual. To take better targeted measures to help the poor and lift them out of poverty, we should improve their impact. The key is to find the right approaches, establish effective mechanisms, make real efforts in targeted policy making, and deliver real results in policy implementation. We should determine who must receive poverty relief and identify the population and the poverty level of the truly impoverished and the root causes of their problems, so as to implement targeted policies for different households and individuals. We should determine who is to implement poverty relief develop a working mechanism in which the central government makes overall plans, the governments of provinces and equivalent administrative units take charge, and governments at municipal, prefectural, and county levels implement the decisions. Governments at all levels should define a clear division of labor, clarify their own responsibilities, assign specific tasks, to designated officials and produce a thorough evaluation of their performance. We should determine how to implement poverty relief according to the different cases of poverty-stricken people and areas. We should adopt five measures. First, boosting the economy to provide more job opportunities. We should guide and encourage all people with ability to work for a better future with their own hands and rely on local resources to end poverty. Second, relocating poverty-stricken people. Those who cannot escape from poverty locally can be relocated year by year in a planned and organized way. We should ensure smooth relocation and settlement 
and make sure those involved have the means to better themselves. Third, providing eco-jobs for poverty-stricken people. We should strengthen ecological restoration and protection in impoverished areas, increase transfer payments in important ecological areas, expand the scope of those eligible for preferential policies, and enable impoverished people with the ability to work to serve as eco-workers, for example, as forest rangers. Fourth, improving education in poverty-stricken areas. The best way to help the poor is to raise their educational level. National education funds should continue to be weighted towards poverty-stricken areas for basic education and vocational education. We should improve the education services in impoverished areas and direct particular attention to young children from impoverished rural households, especially children who stay in rural areas while their parents have gone to the cities as migrant workers. Fifth, improving social security for poverty alleviation. Among the poverty-stricken population, those who have completely or partially lost the ability to work should be guaranteed Social Security. We should readjust the rural poverty line and rural subsistence allowances and provide other forms of social relief. We should increase medical insurance and medical aid for poverty relief and ensure the rural poor are covered by the new type of rural cooperative medical care and serious illness insurance. We should increase efforts in poverty relief in the old revolutionary base areas of the CPC from before the founding of the PRC. Taking targeted measures to help the impoverished means lifting them out of poverty. We should set a timetable, a step-by-step -step schedule to complete this poverty relief program, being neither over-conservative nor over-impetuous. We should give a grace period in which we continue to implement poverty relief policies in designated poor areas that have eliminated poverty. We should evaluate the results of our work against strict criteria and in terms of every household and individual until they are recognized by the public. While taking targeted measures for poverty relief, we should enhance and improve the CPC's leadership party committees and governments at all levels must proceed with confidence, take on responsibilities, and do solid work to reduce poverty. Officials at all levels should press on with the work of poverty alleviation with passion and determination. In places where poverty alleviation work is tough, party committees and governments should take the fight against poverty as their top priority for the 13th five-year plan period, 2016 to 2020, and use it to promote local and social economic development. Authorities at all levels should sign written pledges concerning their goals. We should establish an annual report and supervision system for poverty alleviation to enhance accountability. Their actual performance in poverty alleviation should be a major criterion for selecting officials. We should, test, we should test officials on the front line of the battle against poverty and encourage them to distinguish themselves. We should strengthen rural grassroots party committees, intensify the fight against poverty, and select capable first-in-commands and leading groups. Our input in, develop or in development-oriented poverty alleviation should be adopted, adapted to the requirements for victory in this battle. Accordingly, we should increase special funds and infrastructure investment in the state budget allocated to poverty relief. Transfer payments for general purposes and special transfer payments for improving standards of living should be further shifted towards poverty-stricken areas. Provincial budgets and eastern areas, which are paired up with western impoverished areas for the purpose of fighting poverty, should increase financial support for poverty relief. We should multiply efforts to integrate funds for poverty relief. To reduce poverty through financial measures, we should accelerate the pace of rural financial reform and innovation. 
we should promote transparent management of poverty relief funds, investigate every crime of abusing power in poverty relief, and severely punish those who embezzle, exploit, falsely claim, or squander poverty relief funds. To eliminate poverty, the impoverished should rely on their own hard work. There is no mountaintop we cannot reach. There is no voyage without a final destination. We should arouse the initiative of grassroots officials and people in poverty-stricken areas and encourage them to act with passion and fight poverty through hard work. We should also mobilize all social forces to join in poverty alleviation.